Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, if you are watching Talk TV on YouTube, click the subscribe button. Subscribe, I might get that right. Subscribe button right now so you never have to miss another Talk TV show again. It'll just pop up and it will tell you when we're on. How's that for service? And remember, if you're actually watching Talk TV on the TV and you need to get in the car and drive somewhere, then hey, presto, you can just talk, uh, listen to us on Talk uh, Radio. There you go. So you can always keep up to date with what's going on, uh, especially our question of the day. Now, our question of the day is, how do you feel about having a multi-millionaire uh, as a prime minister? Um, you know, do you think that if you've got millions and millions and millions, you can really be, can you really know what it's like to struggle to put food on the table or, or you know, just pay your everyday, your electricity bill or your heating bill? I mean, you might know it. You, I, don't get me wrong. You're not stupid. You, you might know it. Uh, but do you know what it's actually like to have to make a decision between, say, putting the heating on, uh, you know, or or eating? Because there are many, many families now using using food banks, for instance, and they most of them are working families. Do you can you even put in your mind the idea of working your guts out, both parents working really hard and still absolutely struggling, going to bed at night with your stomach churning about how you're going to meet the next bill you know telling porky pies to the landlord and and feeling really guilty all of those sorts of things you know thinking about christmas coming up and you know are you going to buy presents for everybody or are you, are you going to have to explain to the kids they can't have those things i mean are those the sorts of things that you feel a multi-millionaire uh leader can feel viscerally you know, he might he, he might be worrying about where the money goes and how he pays this, that and the other. But that whole thing of your loved ones, your kids, your wife, your husband going without. Do you think ah, that doesn't matter? Or do you think maybe, yes, it absolutely does. Give us a call on that because we're about to have a debate on it. Give us a call on it. Numbers 0344 1000 0344-499-1000. You can text the word TALK to 8722 or tweet at talk tv let us know how you think because as i said before we're about to have a debate on it uh when you know well rishi sunak is is prime minister as prime minister it'll be the first time in history that the occupants of number 10 downing street will be richer than a monarch in buckingham palace and as i said before at a time when millions are struggling with the cost of living crisis uh sunak um will also almost rival the king in the terms of the numbers of official residences as well. Do you think that that matters or not? An interesting one. I thought we would talk about this. And joining me now are Marilyn uh, Devonish, who's a specialist, remote and flexible working implementation consultant. I think I've got her title there, right? And Dr. Gewold, who's CEO of Fair Money Personal Finance and a credit expert. So let me start with you, Marilyn. Do you think it makes any difference when you've got a multi-millionaire um, at the helm? Can he truly understand what the sort of people that I described, you know, people are doing it tough. Do you think he can really understand what they're going through? So first of all, Tricia, thank you so much for being um, inviting me on the show. Delighted to be here. And one of the things I would say for me, it's not a flat out no, just because of his financial status, because there are a few factors I'd say would come into play, which will help us determine whether or not that's possible. Background and upbringing. We know he didn't grow up struggling like you've described. There's also the piece back in the day, Daniel Goleman described that as emotional intelligence. Does he have a sense of awareness? Is there the level of empathy there? And number three, I would say, is there a desire and a will, even if you don't have the first two, to actually connect with people and have a deeper appreciation? So for me, it's not a question of you've got money, therefore you're out of touch. My thing is, okay, how are you now going to move forwards given that you're no longer in the place of struggle? Is there part of you that knows what it's like? Or do you have the ability to truly empathize and sit with people where they are? So that's the first thing I'll say as we open up the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what about you, Roger? Do you think that you can be out of touch with the actually, you know, the sorts of thing you and I have talked about, the hardships that people are going through now, if you have so many millions? 
I think it's extremely difficult. I mean, in my long career in the city in finance, I've obviously met, you know, quite a few very rich people and I spend a fair amount of time around parliament. Um, I think there's two factors. There's money and then there's what you might call the Westminster bubble, which makes it even worse. Uh, no, these people uh, really are fairly remote from the reality. As you put it so well, can you feel it viscerally? When I spoke, when I interviewed the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, um, I, I, I thought to myself, the reason he's so concerned about the poor is because one of the things, and you can see this, if you Google his surname and mine, you'll see the interview. He told me the story of how he and his father had to scarper because uh, they couldn't pay the rent when he was a kid. Now, that's visceral. That's something that's going to stay with you. Um, I think that people who have a great deal of money can certainly do all the things that Marilyn said, especially if they uh, did some of Marilyn's kind of trainings that I've looked at, which are very interesting. They would learn to empathize more. Uh, but you can't be there if you haven't been there. It's simply not possible. And it does it does cloud the judgment. Now, you, you, one of the things that Roger mentioned there, Marilyn, was the Westminster bubble. Um, and if you do come in contact with your quote unquote ordinary everyday people, as he did with this 70, 70, 77 year old uh, lady uh, re recovering in a Croydon hospital, there's invariably media around and what have you. So you're, you've probably got what, more one eye on what's going to be reported in the photo opportunity than actually sitting and being with somebody um, and, and really hearing their story. What about that Westminster bubble? I mean, doesn't that further, if you like, insulate you from the real experiences of people if you've not had them yourself? Absolutely. I'm going to come back to that desire and willingness piece, as I call it, because if you have the desire and willingness, now there have been, okay, the Christmas carol, we're coming up to Christmas, that's the quintessential story where somebody then gets transported now, back into the past, out into the future, the modern day version of that, for example, the TV show, don't want to plug anyone else, but back to the floor sort of thing, where you, the CEO of the company now becomes the bellboy or the bottle washer. We know we do those things where people may go and do the rough sleeping. It's never going to replicate exactly what it's like to grow up worrying every time the door knocks jumping every time the phone rings but there are ways if people choose to that they can get themselves out of that bubble go back to the street be with people and actually that we're coming then from the heart never mind the photo opportunities get in there with people and actually i would really love to see rishi sunak do the thing where he does go out take all that money away <laughs> put you in a little council flat off you go because you'll get a sense of it. So I think it's possible to put yourself in those situations. Are you going to feel it viscerally if you've never lived it? No. But can you sit with someone and feel where they're coming from? Absolutely, yes. But that's it. That's in an ideal world that he's going to do that. I mean, we know the princes did that. Just to come back to, to, to Roger, your point, you talk about uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. I think he also talks about having parents who are alcoholics and he knows what it's like, uh, you know, to be frightened, to go without, all of those things, uh, which means he can talk to people in a way that someone who hasn't gone through those experiences, he can connect with people in a way that someone who hasn't gone through any of that at all and you don't have to have gone through the whole story but if you haven't been through something that takes you as close to that it, it you you're never going to actually want to leave yeah. that bubble are you yeah yeah I, he's he's a truly great human being he really is and and he rose to be the treasurer of of total the giant french oil company so you know he's been in both places he did yeah. that before he entered the uh, the priesthood but look i mean uh, the point is that uh, what, what what Marilyn says is correct, but you've got to kind of draw the line. These visits by people, all these politicians who go spend an afternoon with a family or something. I mean, that, that's tokenism. I mean, that, that doesn't get you anywhere near it. I have tried for so long to get the obvious things that need to be done for the British public and especially the financially challenged, which is now estimated to be more than 50 percent of the British public from politicians and it falls on deaf ears that I announced on talk TV not long ago that I am hiring a coach 
and I am inviting and taking a bunch of politicians and no less than Rob Rinder said, I am coming on that coach with you um, uh, around the country to have dinner or actually more likely no dinner uh, with families who have to choose between eating and heating. People really don't understand it. They they can't grasp it. If, if yeah, I may let, yeah. Yeah, go on, Roger. I was going to say, but just popping into someone's house, even for a meal, you it's might feel it at the time, but it's that day on day on day on day after day totally, after day totally. grind that's why all this, that that's really why all affects this is, people. That's why all this is is showmanship, tokenism, and a waste of time. I mean, you know, you you need you need to really understand these people. I've been dealing with this demographic for for decades, and I I've met very few uh, politicians and wealthy people who understand it. Let me just give you an example. I've not met him, but I have friends who are are, are friends with Rishi Sunak, and they say he's a really good guy, and he he seems like quite a decent yeah. fellow. And I hope he does well. But there is a lot of trepidation over the fact that he he was, and why should he change his spots? A high tax spending cut, blah blah blah, sort of guy. But I, I think he is a person of the people. I think he's somebody who could empathize with people. But here he is. Now, if you just listen, if we listen to all the words that he has said since he appeared at the podium in front of number 10 about what he's going to do, uh, fix the mistakes that Liz made, growth, energy relief, blah, blah, blah. They've all been quite general. There is only one specific thing that Rishi has said he's going to do. He's only said one concrete thing. I am going to make sure that we pay back the COVID debt as fast as we can, so as not to burden the younger generation. I think to myself, how out of touch can one be? First of all, it took us 60 years to pay back Roger, the World Ro War II debt. Yeah, go on. Okay, Roger. Let me let me just bring let me just bring Marilyn in there just to yeah. stop you there. So, Marilyn, it's 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 not just uh, Rishi. It's the whole. Once you get into politics, you enter that bubble. When I say politics at, at that level, I'd suggest that. And and we were talking to uh, our guest earlier. If you have got a local um, MP who's say a GP in the National Health Service or what have you, then they probably get a different view. Let me just uh, on Roger's point there. Back in the day, and I'm old enough to remember when you had politicians like Jack Straw, David Blunkett, uh, you know John Prescott. People who actually, when I say got their hands dirty, were literally shoveling coal or, or carrying coal, living hand to mouth, you know, uh, and, and when they spoke with unions, it's why unions, I believe, became so strong, when they sp spoke for the working man, it, it wasn't platitudes, it wasn't out of touch, it was, they could literally say a sentence and people would go, oh, and they'd feel it in their hearts. How can you do that when you're in that bubble and then on top of that, you challenge the king of the country for the number of residences you are having and heating uh, and, and the amount of money you've got? Oh, absolutely. And Roger, I love the points you've made and thank you for looking at my work. I appreciate that also. One of the reasons <laughs> I'm saying what I'm saying is because now I'm not necessarily spending all my time with millionaires and billionaires. However, the ones that I had mm -hmm. met and the ones that I've spoken to, and it could just be because they're residing in the world that I'm in of personal development and self-improvement and personal growth. The ones I've sat with and the ones that I've met are doing such amazing things in the world. Now, some of them don't speak about it. They're just quietly behind the scenes, just mm -hmm. getting on with it and doing it. And others are more public about it. So for me to just go, oh, you're a billionaire. How can you possibly? It's based on the ones that I've sat with. I met, where are we now? The eighth. So this was three weeks ago today. I was out at a, a lovely evening mm -hmm. dinner. There were a group of about 12 of us. The person sitting one away from me was a billionaire. The woman I was sitting next to, she, she whispered over and said, he's a billionaire, you know, and I just went, how lovely. And she said, and he makes all of my work possible. And I said, what do you mean? She says he's built the retreat center. He funds everything. He pays for people to attend the retreat center free of charge, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, why is he doing that? And she says, well, money 
it can make differences, but she says he recognizes often when people have a lot of money and they're kind of hoarding it and keeping it, it's not actually doing any good. So one of the things that he has decided to do is then fund things where the money does good but, things. But if I if I can cut in, isn't that a different subject? I mean, nobody's saying that rich people don't do good works and philanthropy. I think what we're talking about here is whether somebody in a position of influence like a politician you know, however much or little money or however many residences they have, I, I you know, I, I think what Trisha is saying is, can they actually understand, if I can just go back to my point about, about COVID, why pay off the COVID debt as fast as you can by taxing us more and cutting spending on NHS, police, defense, health and education? What's the rush? 60 years to pay back the World War II debt. Is he looking for the youth vote? You know, I don't think the young generation is really going to care. And and in a few years time, uh, the, the government will be borrowing for other things anyway. I think it's a completely irrational point uh, to be making. So it's clear that he doesn't understand what it's like to go into a store. And I'm talking about two kinds of people. Uh, number one, somebody who has to go to the Cambran food bank and steal the food at night in South Wales, but leave the cash in the kitty. And I'm talking about somebody higher up the scale who for the first time in their life now has to go into Tesco uh, thinking this is how much I can spend and that's it. And choosing Tesco beans yes. for the first time ever instead of Heinz beans. Does Rishi really get that? I don't think so. And do you think it makes, look, to both of you, does it make a difference? Uh, and as uh, you, you pointed out, Marilyn, Rishi Sunak came from a middle class background, a comfortable background. Do you think it makes a difference if somebody really has had a rags to riches, you know, clawed their way up and has a, a, a maybe like Justin Welby, like the Archbishop of Canterbury? Is there a difference if they've really, really gone through those tough times? Um, and, and does that make a, a difference to how they are? I, I'm going to come back to that question. We've got to take a, a quick break. My uh, question to the audience as well and people listening is, how do you feel? Do you feel that any of what you've just heard and what we will continue to hear makes any difference? Do you think having a multimillionaire making up policies which, uh, you know, coming up with policies which will affect your life, does it make any difference how rich they are? That's what I'm asking you to call in about. Uh, more on that and the number. At Skywork in every room. Welcome back. Welcome back. We are discussing wealth. Can you have somebody who challenges the king in the number of residences and uh, is richer than the king? In number 10, making policies and making decisions that affect the ordinary, everyday, struggling uh, British person. Uh, joining me, as you may remember, is uh, Marilyn Devonish, who's a specialist in remote and flexible working imp implementation, and also uh, Dr. Roger Gewalb, CEO of Fair Money, Personal Finance and, and Credit Expert. Uh, so, so my question there was, if you, Marilyn, and I'll start with you, if you have somebody who's surely really struggled at the beginning, they are are they not going to have more of an idea if they have to make policies if they and this is the thing we're talking about they they're coming up with policies if they have to make policies or champion people it comes from a place of true understanding surely uh, you know there's a difference between altruism and i've been there i've done it i've got the t-shirt and so i'm going to i'm going to change things i remember the days when politicians got into parliament to to change things because they had been workers Wonderful. And I'm just going to very quickly just come back to one thing Roger said. The reason I cited the example of the billionaire is just to kind of highlight why I would say I'm not going to make a blanket statement. They're all the same. Coming back to policy, yeah. and you make a very good point. The way it should work with regards to policy, and I'm not here in the capacity today as being a local councillor, but I am where I work. I cannot make a decision and then just go and say to the mayor and the chair of the council, I think we're doing this there's a process. Mm -hmm. So the very people you described who have been there, who have lived it, who are with their constituents, who are having those conversations, this is where your MP should now be voting in the right way. So if Rishi does come up with something, you go, that is completely out of touch. He's not the one person who's just going to say, we're doing this. There is due process. And this now would speak to our political system. 
If he is starting to make policies which are completely out of touch and everyone votes them in, now we have a problem and that's where we really need to be looking as well because those systems and processes should be there to guard against that. So even if he turns out to be not the good guy that Roger has said and completely out of touch, we have processes, we should have processes in place to stop that and nip that in the bud and the public also can then vote with their hands and, and and put that X in the box when it comes to we're not this is this is this is not right. This is not how things should be done. So Roger, so it doesn't matter in that case how much money uh, a prime minister may have because uh, as, as Marilyn says there are should be checks and balances around uh, to to sort of balance that up. I guess it was sort of prescient of me to change my badge. I mean, if only, um, you know, <laughs> I mean, we are where we are with a mess that's going to take quite some time to get out of uh, because Liz, who, who I understand is now a consultant to, to Joe Biden on communications, she's going to begin by teaching him how to say Rishi Sunak. Um, uh, because Liz didn't observe due process, she just went ahead with Quasi and uh, adopted all of these measures uh, without even the backup. So uh, if only it worked like that. And then secondly, of course, there is the thing called the whip. You know, I mean, when a prime minister or a senior politician wants something done, uh, if only, Marilyn, it worked like that and there was reasonable democratic discussion. But, you know, you get the whip taken away from you or ostracized if you don't follow the line. So when somebody strong enough wants something strong done, even if it's going in the wrong direction, it's going to happen. No, I think that I think that really to really understand the demographic of a the poor and B, the average Brit. It's kind it's kind of like it's kind of like talking to a fish about water. Do you ever talk to a fish about water? You know, it has no idea what water is. Cause you wake up, as you said, you wake up in the morning with dread. How am I going to feed my kids today? What am I going to eat? Can I turn on the heat this afternoon? If you don't live like that, if that isn't ingrained in your psyche, your DNA, every cell in your body. You know, you're not going to be able to understand everything these people are saying. Mm. I, it makes you wish for the old ways of of um, recruiting. I'm not saying all politicians are like that, but nowadays it seems to be uh, doesn't, almost doesn't matter which party you come from. There are a hell of a lot of politicians who come from the same. You know, I want to go into politics rather than being a shop steward or having a, you know, and I said there are many exceptions to that, but that real working at the coal front and, and wanting to do something uh, like that. But it, I'm sure it's a debate and we've opened it up to our audience as well. So uh, it's a debate that will go on for some time. So let me thank you both, uh, Dr. Roger Gewalb for your time and uh, Marilyn uh, Devonish. Thank you so much uh, for hopefully giving some people uh, some food for thought. What do you think? What do you think? What's your take on this? Do you think that having a multimillionaire uh, at number 10 and being, I guess, the face of policies and what have you, does it does it vex you, as my, my West Indian mum used to say? Or do you think, ah, it doesn't matter. Rich people have been telling us what to do forever. Or it doesn't matter what somebody earns. Or do you think like someone like we mentioned, Justin Welby, who's been at the very pits and, and really struggled and then worked in money and has the whole range of, uh, you know, experiences. Do you kind of lament the days when those people were the mainstay of politics, as I have to admit I do? Um, we do have callers um, uh, 